Recognizing one's heart is a method of practice that can be exercised in everyday life. When waiting for a bus, for example, if the bus is late, you may feel anxious, and if it arrives on time, you may feel satisfied. At first, you may think the problem is with the bus, but eventually, you can realize that I feel happy when it comes as I want it to, and I feel anxious when it doesn't. In other words, we feel a sense of satisfaction when things go as we want them to, and our hearts react negatively when things don't go our way. Suppose you have an appointment with someone, and you arrive 30 minutes early while the other person is 5 minutes late. Then, you may raise an issue like, why are you so late? And waiting for those 5 minutes can be very boring. On the other hand, if you arrive 10 minutes late for the appointment and the other person is also 10 minutes late, they may apologize, saying, sorry for being late, but you may respond with, it's okay, you could be late. Even though the other person is 20 minutes late, you respond like an adult. This shows that the problem is not whether the other person is late or not, or whether they are 5 or 10 minutes late. It is about how our hearts react when we expect the other person to come early but they come late, or when we expect them to come late but they come exactly as we want it. Ultimately, it depends on whether we get what we want. Similarly, in a marriage, it is not about whether your spouse is excellent or not. It is about whether you expect your spouse to do something 100%, and they do only 70%, which makes you feel like they are lacking. Or if you expect them to do only 50%, and they do 70%, which makes you feel satisfied. If you understand this logic, you can change your perspective on human relationships. However, you often demand that the other person satisfies you, which is not likely to succeed because it depends on whether they will do it or not. On the other hand, if you lower your expectations a bit, you can be satisfied, and that is something you can do. If you keep thinking, my family should come home by 10 o'clock, when you see someone coming in at 12 o'clock, you will fight with them every night. But if you think, at least they come in before midnight, you won't fight even if they are a little late. I am not simply telling you to just compromise. This is not a matter of compromise. Trying to fix someone is a difficult task that generally requires a conversation, but even then, it's not easy. I can't even fix myself, so how can I fix someone else? Therefore, instead of trying to fix the other person, I am suggesting that it is more helpful to look at how I can accept the other person's point of view. If you cannot live with someone who is always late, even if they have good qualities or a lot of money, you can simply say goodbye. It's just a matter of your own choice. Similarly, if everything else is fine except for someone being late, you can say where can you find someone who is completely perfect in this world and accept it. Either way, it's my decision to make. In this case, as the owner of the situation, I have to decide what to do. If I keep looking at it as that person is the problem, I will eventually lose the decision-making power over this issue. By always waiting for the other person to change, I become a slave to their decisions. Even if I think I'm better than the other person and try to change them, I end up living as a slave. Whatever decision the other person makes, it's their life, and I have the power to decide what I will do in that situation. If you feel anxious when you are with your father, there may be various reasons for it, such as being scolded when you were younger. Investigating such causes is the job of a psychologist. And the person involved doesn't necessarily have to do it themselves. To give an analogy, someone who knows the technical aspects of how a car operates is a technician. But a driver just needs to know how to start the car and drive it. Similarly, if someone understands the psychological principles behind their actions, they can become a scholar or a teacher. However, as someone living their own life, all you need to do is recognize when you feel anxious. You don't need to research why you feel that way. Feeling anxious is not a good thing. So recognizing it means combining the understanding that my mind is anxious and anxiety is not a good thing. Therefore, recognizing anxiety means that it will soon subside. If you want to be free from your father's influence, you should conduct experiments frequently. You can observe your anxiety when you are with your father. When you are a little further away from him, you are fine, but when you are close to him, you feel anxious. By observing this, you can investigate why you feel anxious even though you have no relationship with your father. This is similar to observing fear at night. When you feel fear, you can hold an electric switch and conduct an experiment. When you turn the switch off, you feel fear, and when you turn it on, the fear disappears. By turning the switch on and off repeatedly, you can investigate why the fear comes and goes even though the light is simply turning on and off. This is called exploration. When you investigate by asking why is this happening, the anxiety disappears. If you feel anxious when you are close to your father but not when you are far away, and this repeats, it's better to practice being close to him. Practicing with someone who is not a good match helps you learn faster because you have more opportunities to practice. Those who feel anxious when they are with their father but are fine when they are far away may think that the problem is solved, but the anxiety will return when they are close again. So staying away is just a way to protect yourself, but solving the problem by being close to your father is true freedom. 
When symptoms are so severe that they cannot be resolved by facing them, you should first avoid them and enjoy stability. When our bodies are sick, if our immune system is weak, we isolate ourselves and get treatment first. But if our immune system is strong, we can fight off even if there are germs. Similarly, after gaining immunity, you should be free from your father's presence. From this perspective, when you talk to your father and feel anxious, you notice I feel anxious now, I feel anxious when I'm with my father. Rather than thinking so that's the problem, it's better to observe and analyze by asking why am I anxious. If you practice this a lot, it will improve quickly. Improvement means that the intensity of the anxiety gradually weakens. At first, I couldn't get close because of the strong rejection reaction. But now spending time with my father is an opportunity to practice so it's okay to feel anxious. Whether you're anxious or not, you'll eventually reach a point where it doesn't matter. It's good to identify the cause. But when we try to identify the cause, we keep thinking instead. So I'm not saying don't investigate the cause. But if you focus too much on identifying the cause, you'll keep thinking and end up getting more worried. When you're in distress, you need to investigate by asking why am I really suffering? Rather than thinking about the distress, investigation makes distress disappear. But over 90% of you keep thinking. So when you meditate, you're told not to think. Investigation and thinking are different. Investigation is like a scientist trying to identify the cause of something. So we say we investigate a topic, we seek a topic. On the other hand, thinking is when you tilt your head and think about this and that in your mind. So in practice, thinking is called delusion. Not investigating but thinking about this and that is called indulging in delusions. Thank you for watching. Continue to watch more positive messages to be happier right here.